Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for taking the time to come down to my talk today, and it's on journey through life on bicycle. Um, I'd like to thank CPF for it, um, inviting me to be one of the speakers. Um, and I'm Dr. Hing Siong Chen, and I'm from the I'm the president of the Singapore Cycling Federation. All right, today um, we're going to talk about cycling, and this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's going to be quite a long talk, so we have about an hour. So at any time, if you have some questions that you would like to ask, um, you can start posting the questions already. And uh, we'll take it along the way, or we can take it at the end of the session. Um, so today's speech, we're going to talk about um, an introduction to cycling, and then the health benefits of cycling. Um, very important, choosing the right equipment. And then we're going to talk about cycling around Singapore, and something very passionate, that I'm very passionate about, and that's cycling around the world. And to finish off the talk, we will still we'll talk something about high-performance cycling. And um, nowadays, very importantly, we'll talk about cycling and road safety. Um, we'll also talk about some topics on indoor cycling and cycling esports. And um, to finish the uh, talk off, we'll talk about the future of cycling in Singapore. And uh, I'll also end off by talking a little bit about Singapore Cycling Federation. All right, introduction to cycling. I think cycling is a growing sport in Singapore. And uh, currently, it's the third most popular sport in Singapore after walking and running. Um, with the yeah, COVID situation around, more and more people are taking out exercising. And um, cycling seems to be one of the very popular like, activities that have uh, sprung out over the past one or two years, right? In Singapore, there's a very good cycling infrastructure. As uh, you can see, the roads are very well paved. We have a lot of park connectors and pavements. Um, roads are, of course, a bit more difficult. Um, you have to be an experienced rider. It's good to, have, um, to be comfortable with riding with cars. However, in Singapore, if you're a beginner cyclist, um, you can always go to the park connector network this is a system of shared paths and uh, connects a lot of Singapore um, parks and all the best views that you can see in Singapore. Okay, so health benefits of cycling. Uh, I think cycling is a very good form of exercise. Um, when we get older, we need to do some physical training. Um, there are two main types of physical training. And one is um, strength training and the other one is cardiovascular training. So cycling is one of those activities that you can actually um, enjoy the benefits of both of these um, um, training modalities. Um, with cycling as well, you can see there's also an improvement in your joint mobility. It strengthens your bones. It's also less impact on your knees and less impact on your ankles. So for as you get older, um, if you have um, arthritis of your knees and you have... Um, bone problems. I think cycling is a very good choice. Um, with um, COVID over the past two years, I think psychological health is very important. Um, cycling is one of those activities that is outdoors. You can do with your family and your friends and it takes you out into the great outdoors and it helps a lot because every time after cycling, I feel much better. Yep. And with cycling, you can also help to decrease your body fats. And exercise is known to reduce cancers. Uh, this is one of those um, exercises where the more you exercise, um, it helps with also your chronic illnesses if you have. So there are usually three very common chronic illnesses in older people. Um, you have your typical diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. Um, some people call it three highs or the sun cows. So with exercise that you can do with cycling, this will also help reduce those chronic illnesses and improve your overall fitness and your immune system. Okay, so choosing the right equipment. So before you start cycling, I think um, there are a few things you need to look around um, to buy. Um, the first thing you can start with is the helmet. I think the helmet is a very important thing that you must cycle with. Um, in Singapore, um, if you're cycling on the roads, you will need to wear a helmet. It's uh, required by law. So before you buy any helmet, do not just go onto the internet and buy a very cheap helmet. It may not be uh, proof. So you should look for 
approved standards, probably there are the European standards and the um, Japanese and local Asian standards. Um, so there are certain safety features that the helmets will have. So go down to a local bike shop and um, at those shops, they will recommend you helmets that, are, that will satisfy the safety requirements. Okay? And with the fit of the helmet, um, so certain helmets come in different sizes and different shapes. So it's very important to try um, your different helmets that are available at the shop. Fit them on before you buy them. Make sure that they are the right size and, and now they have Asian fit so that the helmets are actually um, more fitting to your heads. So helmets also have air vents. So look for helmets that um, have very good airflow so when you cycle, it's not so hot. And also the visibility, like the colors are very important. A white helmet um, is more visible. And sometimes you also have fluorescent helmets. And helmets do not last forever. So after two or three years, it's time to change your new helmet and also replace it immediately if you have an accident. Okay, clothing. Um, it's important to wear comfortable clothing. So in Singapore, it can be quite hot. Some clothing comes with SPF. Um, that will help you prevent sunburns. Avoid loose and baggy clothing. So that's quite important if you are cycling. You don't want um, baggy pants that may be caught in the gears. Um, that could be quite dangerous. You could fall. So now with materials that are very advanced, um, dry fit materials are very good for cycling. So you do not sweat as much. Okay, and the last thing, avoid flip-flops and sandals. Um, always protect your, your feet with proper shoes so that when you fall, you do not get big abrasions and cuts. Okay, coming up to the next one, choosing the right equipment. Okay, there are many different types of bicycles that you can see on the road. Um, so, it, it's very much your comfort. Um, there are mountain bikes that you can ride. There are foldies, which are very, very popular nowadays. And um, I think at the end of the day, you want to try a few of the bicycles and when you find one that you're comfortable with, you can probably buy it. So it's no harm trying a few, borrow it from some from your friends and then get used to the bicycle and then finally choose one that you're comfortable with. Okay, so in a bicycle like this one here, this is a road bike. Um, so they are the size of the handlebar, they are different heights, they have different widths and um, the seat height and seat position are all different as well. So these are all very customized. As you start cycling, you will more or less get used to the position um, that will suit you. Sometimes you can also go for a professional bike fit and they'll be able to fit you up with the correct size bike. Okay, saddles are a very personal equipment. There are many different types of saddles. It's going to be really trial and error. Um, I think I've gone through many different saddles and lots of saddle saws before I finally chose one that would more or less fit me. Um, some people like more padding, some people like less padding. Um, so it's a very personal choice. So choose a few and um, when you find one that you like, then quickly buy a few so that you can put it on all your different bicycles. Okay, riding postures, um, always have a very relaxed posture. I think make sure that your shoulders are not too hunched over. Keep your spine comfortable and you, when you bend over, you shouldn't get too much pain. I think saddle height is very important. If your saddle height is too low, right, um, your pelvis will not be very stable. If it's too high, you'll be rocking a lot on the saddle. Um, so very often, this comes with trial and error. The more you ride, um, the more comfortable you'll be with a certain uh, position. Um, it's very useful if you know, your friends who are more experienced can look out for you and see um, whether your riding position is correct and give you some advice. If not, then like what I said earlier, look for some bike fitters. There are many bike fitters around. You can Google them. And uh, for, I guess, small price, they can actually fit you perfectly on the bike. Okay, so cycling in Singapore. I think Singapore is quite a small place, not very big. But you'll be surprised when you start riding onto the roads. Um, there are many very beautiful areas that you can cycle around. Um, there are farm areas, there are park connectors. Um, even the, on the picture, you can see there's a railway corridor which you can cycle on. So 
even the offshore islands are great places that you can ride on. So you could be riding on roads, you could be riding on park connectors, you could be riding in the mountain bike trails. So park connectors are a form of island-wide network of corridors that you know, is built by um, national parks. I think they've done a great job. Um, it connects almost all parts of the island. If you look at this big picture now on the park connector, um, I've tried many of them before. I think um, the railway corridor, a lot of us are familiar with that. Um, since the uh, railway has been closed many years ago, now you know, every weekend you see lots of people walking and cycling on it. The best times to go on it, uh, I would say during um, an off-peak period, now that you, know, you can take leave here and there, an afternoon or a morning on a weekday is the best time. Um, there's also the um, Coast to Coast Southern Trail I think it's almost completed. Maybe in the next one or two years, most of it will be linked up. So you can cycle all the way from Changi to um, Tuas so, and um, to the lamppost one. So these are uh, fantastic networks where you know, it's very safe. You can actually cycle with your family, your children. Um, there are no cars on it. So I think this is one of the, the best ways to begin cycling actually on the park connector. Okay. And if you do not own a bicycle, there are many places where you can actually rent a bicycle. So there are app-based rental bikes. I think um, there are a few brands there you can see. There's um, SG Bikes, Anywhere Bikes, uh, Mobike. And also, if you go down to the uh, East Coast uh, um, Park on the weekend, you can see there are many bike rental shops as well. So these are very good, um, I'll say, introductions to cycling. So you do not need to actually buy a bicycle immediately. You can actually just start enjoying riding first. And when you get more used to it and you see um, that you enjoy riding it, you can actually go further and buy a bicycle. Yeah. So I'm not sure if any of you have tried cycling on the offshore islands in Singapore. I think there are four there. They are very commonly used for cycling. I've tried three of them. Um, there's Coney Islands, which is just off um, Pongo. You can just cycle in. I think the first picture is the one that you see over there with the wild boar. That's actually Coney Island. Yeah, and then there's Pula Ubin. Um, you, for a small price of, um, I think, $2, you can actually get onto a bum boat and you can pay another $2 to bring your bicycle and you can spend an afternoon in Pula Ubin riding around. Um, the second picture with a very nice reservoir there with um, people taking photos and bicycles scattered around. That's actually Pula Ubin. And the, la the other one, St. John's Island and Lazarus Island, um, I think they're connected by a very nice uh, causeway. Um, that's also a fantastic place that you can go cycle. Um, you can take a boat ride. I think it's just about 20 minutes and you can get onto the island and cycle around. And of course, the last one is Sentosa. I think all of us has been, have been there. Um, it's also a place where you can actually cycle around. It's pretty hilly. So it's a nice um, place for half a day of cycling. Okay, and mountain um, nature reserves in Singapore. I think in the earlier talk, um, there was, we were talking about animals in nature reserves. So um, you have to be very careful. Don't disturb the animals too much. There are these four major nature, nature trails that you can go on to. Um, there's a chestnut mountain bike trail. There's a Mandai Track 15 that starts from the zoo all the way to Bukit Timah. Um, Bukit Timah mountain bike reserve trail. Um, okay, that one's a more technical trail. And Kenridge, there is a, down, a mountain bike downhill trail. And um, also in Ubin, there's a Kitam mountain bike trail. So if you wanted to go off-road and see you know, more of the nature up close and personally, I think mountain bike um, riding in these nature reserves are quite a good option. Okay, so coming to road cycling, I think this is what a lot of um, people are more used to. Um, you can I can say that Singapore has one of the best roads for you to ride on. I think LTA has done a great job. Um, all the roads in Singapore um, are very well maintained. There are numbers that you can call whenever you see a small little pothole. Um, I think Singapore is moving towards a car-like society by 2030. So there's a lot of uh, policies in place and there are a lot of improvement to the cycling infrastructure around housing estates and the city and the countrysides. 
So maybe I'll go through some of the photos there. Um, I think the top photo is um, cycling towards uh, Marina Bay Sands on a Sunday morning. And uh, the photo on the left, it's a team ride with my team and we are riding along Salita Dam, um, going towards Serangoon Island. And the other one, um, the very beautiful quiet road that you see that is um, along Salita Reservoir. Oh, sorry, Upper Pierce Reservoir. Yes. So in Singapore, there are many trends coming along now. If you look in the social media, um, there's something called doing the round island. So that's in one single ride, you're trying to ride between 100 to 160 kilometers. So you can see the, this is a picture of a app it's called Strava. And um, you can see the, part of the route taken by, um, by someone who's done a really long ride. I think it's almost 160 kilometers there. And um, lamppost one, which is very famous, um, it's the only lamppost in Singapore that is, you can legally put stickers on. So it's a mecca at the moment. Um, I think most cyclists would take you know, um, a trip down there just to take a photograph. Um, and then also now there's a pattern, there's a new trend of people doing, drawing Strava pictures, like lions, malayans, and uh, well, T-Rexes. Okay, even, and the most amazing thing, um, I think just last month, Google Maps launched a new cycling navigation feature in Singapore. Um, it's the first in Southeast Asia. So it covers um, more than 6,800 6, kilometers of cycling trails. So if you were to use your Google Map now and you put it onto the cycling mode, um, it will choose for you the most um, cycle-friendly path um, you will be using the roads that have less cars. Um, they, will use it, they will use PCNs and they will use um, the railway corridors. Um, and they will not bring you onto an expressway, which is something you do not want to do. So it's available on desktop and it's available on your mobile phone. So you can actually use it on your mobile phone, put it onto your bicycle and it can take you on the route around Singapore where it's most cycle-friendly. Okay. Now, moving on to... Cycle holidays. So cycling around the world, um, I think Singapore is quite small and um, you will not know real cycling until you try cycling overseas. The, um, cycling holidays are one of the most um, amazing trips that you can plan. I think in your lifetime, you'll be good to organize a trip with your friends to actually go on a cycling holiday. There are many places you can go. I think going back to the map, um, in Southeast Asia, um, most people would like to go to maybe Japan, Hokkaido, uh, or they can go to um, Thailand or Chiang Mai. Um, in Europe, there are many more places like France, Italy, um, and Spain. These are all beautiful places to cycle. Um, it's a great way to actually see local culture and, and also to experience the sights and to meet the people who are there locally. So um, this is um, some photos of me and my wife on different cycling trips. I think there was um, the US and there was Spain um, and there was Italy and there's France. So it's a great way to actually see the countryside and, um, and you can eat as much as you can because you'll be cycling a lot every day. All right, so planning an overseas trip. Um, there are many things that you need to plan when you go overseas. Quite often, it's good to go with someone who has already gone before. So, of course, number one, choice, choose your dream location. Uh, number two, yeah, get, get the right season. So, you want to go to Europe somewhere in summer. Um, so, it doesn't rain much. The days are long. The weather is very kind and it's fantastic to cycle. It's like 15 to 20 degrees and you can cycle for many hours without being tired. Um, then the second step is to plan your budget. So, you can either be self-guided or you can actually go with a tour company. So quite often, there are many tour companies that you can travel with. They will arrange everything for you. There's a support vehicle. They will arrange the hotels for you. So if it's the first time you're going on a cycling trip, it will be quite good to actually join the tour company. So, okay, the next one. Number three, book your air tickets in advance, pay your deposits and plan your leave. So this is something you need to do um, far ahead because if you want to plan it well, 
Um, it gets very popular towards the time when you're getting close to it and it's much more expensive. So book everything early. And the next step, the next most important thing is to start training. All right. So cycling in Singapore is not as tough as when you go there and cycle a mountain. So you need to see your itinerary over the next couple of days and see um, how many kilometers you're going to cycle each day and how much climbing you're going to do. And you need to adjust your training program to prepare yourself for your trip and then get ready for your adventure of your lifetime. Okay, some fun facts. Nowadays, um, very hot in um, Europe, um, there are e-bikes. So this really opens the opportunity to everyone to cycle. So you could bring your parents, you could bring your wife, you could bring people of different abilities and they can still do the same route. So e-bicycle, basically, um, there's a battery inside the bicycle. Um, so it makes you um, stronger, makes it much easier for um, your companions to keep up with you. So most tour companies actually offer this option as well. So there's no excuse not to go. Now we come to high-performance cycling. So high-performance cycling is um, all about going faster and pushing the limits of your ability. So when you say high-performance cycling, it could be preparing yourself for racing, it could be just trying to achieve a personal best, or it could be also you know, training to go on a trip overseas. This is all about improving how fit you are and how much more you can ride in terms of time and speed. So there are three pictures here. Um, we have, for example, our Singaporean Go Chun Huat. So he is a Singaporean who's riding for our national team. And now he's so, last year he was riding for a world tour team by exchange. Um, the second picture we have is Riyadh. Um, just over summer, the past two months or three months, um, he was there um, doing mountain bike, um, urban cross, riding, racing. And then we have um, Steve and Kiming who represented Singapore in the Paralympics. So this is all about high-performance cycling. So the question now most people ask me is, what is high-performance cycling? Well, it's all about organizing yourself. So number one, you design a program to meet your racing goals, right? So maybe you have a race in six months' time that you're going to be ready for. So you design a program that will bring you to peak at that race in six months' time. And along the way, you'll be monitoring your training progress and you will have a feedback loop and see you that your program is effective. Um, together with your training, you want to have very good uh, fueling. So you want to eat well uh, so that your body can perform better. And then on top of that, you'll probably want to improve your aerodynamics and your riding position. So now it becomes very necessary to get a good bike fit to make sure that you're very comfortable on the bike and you have the least, least wind resistance when you're riding. And then you will also test your potential. So coming up to that six months, every month you may test yourself. Um, there are ways to test yourself. You could do a ward test or you could do a, a distance test or... So you can see whether you're improving over the time period. And the most important part, of course, is to stay injury-free for the whole um, training program and to make sure that you do not overtrain. There are many pits for the pitfalls, and one of them is actually overtraining. So as much as you train, you also need to rest. Okay. So with all that done, you're ready for a race. You can always sign up for a race or sign up for an overseas trip to cycle. Um, Singapore Cycling Federation, we do organize um, several amateur races a day, uh, sorry, a year. Um, in our next year's calendar, we do see ourselves probably organizing 50 to 20 races. So you can always come onto our website uh, and look at the races that are available and, and start training for them. Safe cycling. Okay, this is something that we must definitely talk about. Um, because learning about road safety comes before learning to ride. So this is a very useful resource that we have. Um, you can actually go into a Sports Singapore a Safe Cycling Guide. I'm going to provide a link at the end to all these resources. Um, it's a very detailed um, PDF. You can actually go in and read on all the different things about safe cycling. Okay, so before you start cycling, 
now that we are all quite excited, we're ready to buy a bicycle. Um, and are we fit enough to ride? Are we safe enough to ride? So I think some of people will ask, um, okay, maybe I'm 60 years old. Uh, can, I can, can I cycle? Um, or I'm 45 years old. I have some chest pain. Can I cycle? So this is a very simple questionnaire. Um, it's called a physical activity readiness questionnaire. So there are seven questions there. Um, I think I should go through them. So has your doctor ever said you had a heart attack or you should not do any physical activity unless you're recommended by a doctor? Um, do you have bone or joint problems that is worse when you exercise? Uh, do you feel pain in your chest when you do certain physical activities? Um, or do you have very poor balance? Do you have dizziness? Do you have, have you lost your consciousness before? Um, or do you know any other reasons you should not do physical activity? Or question number six, has your doctor prescribed you any um, drugs for your heart and for your blood pressure? And in the past few months, have you had any chest pain for you're not doing physical activity? So if any of those questions that are on this list, or if you have answered yes to more than one or more of these questions, it's very important that you should consult your family doctor, um, like myself, or your own family doctor before you start exercising, right? So it's very good. I, what I, I, most doctors will recommend is, you know, you probably will do some blood tests, do some treadmill exercises, um, and make sure everything is normal before you start more vigorous ex exercising. And as you start training and exercising, um, make it gradual, right? So build up your, your fitness over a period of time and look for any telltale signs of um, chest pain or giddiness or fainting. If you do not get any and, you, and things look all right, continue training. Yep. So always clear yourself with your doctor before you go on any very vigorous training. Okay, so cycling and the law. Okay, so the bicycle is considered a vehicle as well. So you have to follow the rules on the road when you cycle. So rules and regulations are found in uh, Active Mobility Act and the Road Traffic Act. These are the two things that you have to be very aware of. So just a quick summary, make sure that you have a helmet when you're cycling on the roads. That's compulsory. Uh, when riding in the dark, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., you need lights. So you need a front uh, white light and a back red light. Okay, and all bicycle riders are required to comply with the same rules as vehicles on the road. So here are a summary of some of the rules. Okay, so recent, um, these rules will come into in, effect on the 1st of January. Um, this has just been published, I think, about a month ago by the Active Mobility uh, panel's recommendation to, L, um, to Ministry of Transport. So, if you are a cyclist, um, five bicycles can cycle in a single file, and a maximum of 10 bicycles can cycle when they are riding two abreast. So, remember the maximum number of cyclists, 10 on the road. Okay? And this is for motorists. When you're passing a bicycle, uh, make sure you keep at least 1.5 meters from the bicycle. Um, so this, this is um, more for the safety of the cyclists. Any closer than that, sometimes, you know, some cyclists who are not so um, experienced, they may fall or the um, draft from the bicycle, from the truck or from the car that's passing by can actually affect the bicycle. Okay, cycling in groups, um, the, rec the uh, recommendation now is that <clears throat> um, you need to be cycling um, with a distance of 30 meters between the groups. Okay? This is to allow cars to filter in. I mean, that's the logic behind that. So that, you know, um, basically there, I would say that um, there is harmony between cyclists and, and road users being considerate. Yep. Oops, sorry. Okay. So cyclists are also recommended that they should keep to the left. Um, this is to give cars space to pass on the right. But when we say keep to the left, it's as safe as it's possible because we know that on the side of the road, there's usually 
um, sometimes gravel, there may be um, a drain cover or there may be potholes. So you, can, you should keep as safe as possible to the site. Yep. And when you're riding um, on, the, on the road, um, if it's a single road, you need to cycle um, in a single file. Um, if it's, the road has more than one lane, um, you can cycle two abreast. So there are also different rules for power-assisted bikes. Um, there are also different rules and regulations when you're riding on a cycling path or either on a foot path or on the road. So this, I think, is quite uh, lengthy. I may not actually go through every single thing. Um, okay, cycling paths, basically those are uh, park connectors. Um, so you can go at a maximum speed of 25 kilometers per hour. For footpaths, you can only go at 10 kilometers per hour. You need to remember that. And on the road, you can go at the speed of the traffic that's going on the road. Um, a little bit, uh, just going to say a little bit about the power-assisted bikes. So this is something quite new. Uh, in Singapore, we also have power-assisted bikes. And um, I think a lot of Grab deliveries are on those. Um, coming up from 1st of January, you need to take a test to pass the test before you can get onto a power-assisted bike. Um, there are also certain rules. They need a number plate. They need to be registered. They cannot be more than 20, kilo, uh, 20 kilograms in weight. So th there are specific rules um, that it's good to actually go to the LTA website to look at these rules before um, you buy any of this equipment. Okay, now we come to indoor cycling so, and eSports. Um, indoor cycling and eSports is something very new. Uh, it's been around for a while, but I'll say that recently it's been um, gaining a lot of traction and a lot of people are starting to do it. Um, indoor cycling is a very convenient way of exercising. It's indoors, it's on a stationary bike, it's uh, in a controlled environment, it's quite cool. Um, there are no cars around, so it's a very safe environment. You can focus on endurance or strength training or interval training, um, and you can do high intensity or you can do recovery right. So it's very safe, and um, more and more people are actually signing up for all these gym classes where you can actually um, do indoor cycling. And it can be very motivational because they have, um, you know, it's in the dark, it's in the, in the studio, they have really loud music, and you can probably push yourself even harder than if you were riding with your friends on the normal card connector. Um, so what is cycling esports? So cycling esports is something quite um, new. With the, in the past one or two years, because a lot of races have been cancelled because of COVID, um, actually a lot of people have been trying to, have been joining races from the comforts of their home. So using um, an online platform like Swift, um, you can actually sign on to a race and in the comfort of your house, you could be racing against somebody in another house in Singapore or you could be racing with somebody in another location overseas. And even this competition is um, getting more and more popular. Uh, UCI, which is the international governing body of cycling, has actually got a world championship for it. And we know that you know, coming up to uh, the 2028 Olympics, it may be one of the events that will be featured as well, uh, indoor cycling, um, um, esports. Yeah. So recently, um, Singapore Cycling Federation and uh, SCOGA, which is uh, uh, have teamed up um, to actually develop a esports um, cycling academy. Yeah. So this is something quite new. Um, SCOGA, which is Cyber Sports and Online Gaming Association, um, they, they've actually um, set up this academy and they're going to start going into schools. Yeah. So we're going to bring um, eSports cycling into schools where students can actually take part and start racing with other students in other schools. It's a new form of cycling um, and racing. It's very safe. It's in the confines of the school. Uh, you don't have to go out onto the roads. So we are going to have a few pilot projects with a few schools. So um, yeah, any school principals out there today listening in or any um, head of departments, you can contact us and we can put your school as one of the pilot projects. And um, if, well, it's a CPF talk, if you're retiring next, 
retiring next year. Uh, contact us as soon as possible. Okay, so now we talk about the future of cycling. Um, actually, I was going to say that the future is cycling. Um, there are now about 460 kilometers of cycling paths that are really existing. Um, this will increase to over 800 kilometers by 2023. And based on the um, plans that the government is trying to push for a car like society, it's going to increase even further to about 1,300 kilometers of cycling paths in Singapore by 2030. Um, cycling paths will allow commuters to connect between their homes to the MRT, the bus interchange, um, to shopping malls, to schools. Um, it's very useful as the, the, for the last, uh, last kilometer or the last five kilometer journey. So that, that is the, we, we are think, rethinking um, about micro mobility. So it's going to be very useful for different devices like your bicycles, your personal mobility aids. Um, this can all help people to get around more easily and more conveniently in the last two kilometers. You don't have to drive your car you know, to the supermarket around the corner just to pick up a bottle of milk. And um, th this is an interesting example of um, the roads behind, just behind my clinic where I'm working. Um, it's in Amokyo. It used to be actually four lanes. And I, I remember seeing um, my old patients struggling across, trying to run across the road. And there are cars, there are cars that are cutting each other. So when a car overtakes another car, they go even faster. So, you know, with urban planning and redevelopment, the emphasis now that we can see is actually to increase the, the, the space for sidewalks, um, put in more cycling areas and put in more communal areas for human interactions. Uh, from this picture, you can actually see that um, now they've actually changed the road to a winding road that is more friendly for older people. You can see more, more grass verges. You can see a new cycling lane. Um, and that's just next to the big signboard. So I think moving forward, we can see that our government is actually putting quite a lot of emphasis and putting quite a lot of resources into rethinking about how space is going to be made so that it's more friendly towards you know, active mobility, whether you're commuting by walking or by jogging or on a bicycle or on a uh, power-assisted bicycle. Yeah, so moving forward, I think we're going to see the dynamics change around housing estates and especially um, in places where you can actually now use the bicycle to commute instead of just um, driving from place to place. Okay, so these are some of the resources that um, we, I've used for this talk. Um, there's the Singapore, um, Sport Singapore Guide to Safe Cycling. Um, there's the Singapore National Federa uh, Cycling Federation. We have a national cycling syllabus. Um, I also use some resources from NPUPS, which is Cycling for Fitness, Sports and Wellness. Um, then there's also LTA Cycling Maps and Routes. And of course, the last one is um, our Singapore Cycling Federation website. Um, Singapore Cycling Federation, um, we are the national governing body for promotion and the development of cycling or sports. So you can actually click on any of these resources and um, you can learn much more uh, about what I've been talking about. Okay, so a little to end my, my talk, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Singapore Cycling Federation. Um, as I say, we are the national body that governs uh, the promotion and development of the sport of cycling. Um, we have athletes that represent Singapore. Um, in the picture, our first gold medalist, um, um, Kelvin Sim, who was on the track in um, 2017 in Kuala Lumpur. And um, in Philippines, we have Go Chun Huat. Um, we were established in 1958. Uh, we are recognized by the uh, Sport Singapore as the national governing body. Uh, we are a registered society with IPC status. And uh, two years ago, we received the uh, Charity and Transparency Award um, by the Charity Council of Singapore. And we have affiliations to uh, SNOC, Singapore National Olympic Council, um, 
Asian Cycling Confederation, ACC, and the UCI. So what do we do? Um, our mandate is basically to help address concerns of the general cycling population. So um, to the public who are listening in, if you have any questions or any concerns that you have about cycling, you can always um, write to us or email to us. Uh, we do have a lot of links and talks with LTA, with the traffic police. Um, so if there are any concerns, you can definitely bring it up to them and represent your views. Um, I think safe cycling culture is something that um, SEF has been trying to promote over the past um, few years. In the picture there, you can see we recently did a, um, a, a safe cycling um, campaign with, um, the with the Trucking Association of Singapore. So we actually went out to, um, to the, um, the trucking associations and we handed out um, um, lots of pamphlets and tried to help educate them about you know, the, risk, the uh, difficulties of cycling on the road. And at the same time, we also have uh, reached out to the cyclists to educate cyclists about the dangers of uh, being in the blind spot of a lot of these vehicles. These are heavy vehicles where you know, they can't see a cyclist if you are in their blind spot. So uh, other things that we do, we also organize uh, local competitions and uh, we also promote uh, events, community events. And of course, we also do high performance um, cycling and competitions. So I come to the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we're going to take some questions now. So I think I can see quite a few questions here. Okay. So the first question that we have is... Uh, what is your advice on how to start cycling at 60 years old or over 60? Um, the, question, the, uh, the person asking the question said he has cycled before but never on the road. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think the first step, if you can cycle already on um, the park connectors and in different places, uh, you really have the basic skill. To start going onto the road, I think um, it would be a good idea if you could find a friend to go with or some friends to go with who already cycle on the roads, who are familiar with roads. Um, there are times where it would be better to cycle on the road. So always try and cycle off the peak hours. If it's the first time you're trying, um, you can cycle on a Sunday or in the Sunday morning when it's where the traffic is the lowest. And uh, you can choose certain roads that have less um, traffic. So if you can get friends who can bring you, that would be the best. Okay, second question. How do you find your passion for cycling? Um, I think I started many years ago. Um, I started cycling and I really enjoyed it. And, but there's still something missing. I think you can't cycle alone. So I managed to rope my wife into cycling. It took a long time. Um, I bought her a bicycle and left it in the house. Uh, she never started cycling. She always looked at it. Um, so the trick is to always involve cycling with fun. So I would take her out on a short cycle, but we always would end up in the cafe. Um, so finally, she started cycling. And the more she cycled, she actually enjoyed it. I think if you enjoy um, cycling, the passion will come with it, especially if you do things like trips and cycling holidays, um, you will discover a lot of things that you've never discovered about cycling. So that will bring more passion to your cycling. Okay, where can I learn to cycle as an adult if I've never cycled in my life? Wow, okay. Um, I think it's not difficult. <laughs> you just need some courage. Um, if you want to start trying, I think um, half the battle is won. Um, I have to advertise a little bit now. Singapore Cycling Federation does have a safe cycling um, program and also a learn to cycle program. So we have already developed the national syllabus there, part one, two, and three. You'll be starting with part one. So we will actually teach you about all the basics about cycling, safety, and we will actually teach you how to start balancing. Um, so far from the course um, syllabus that I've seen and their track record, uh, most people can cycle on the first outing within two hours. So um, we're not the only one. I think if you Google, there are many other companies that do it. So you can also um, 
look for those companies. Okay. Uh, next question. Okay. If you are cycling on the roads, you must have lightweight bicycles and road wheels. Wow. Uh, if your bicycle is a Trek 3000 mountain bike, who would, uh, what would you do? Would you change the tires? Okay. Um, I think cycling on the road, um, you can have any bicycle, but if you want to go faster and you want it to be more efficient, then it is true that a lightweight bicycle will help. And if you have road wheels, it will also help. Um, if you have mountain bike wheels, um, we call them knobbies. And if you're cycling on the road, it's a bit noisier, there's more friction, uh, you can't go as fast. You can actually just get slick tires um, and that will really help quite a bit. So you just need to bring your bike, bicycle down to a local bike shop. Um, they can do a switch in the tire for you and that's very, very quick. Yep. Question, another question. Have, I have not, oh, have not cycled for a long time. I want to get a bike. Okay, is a mountain bike or a road bike better for the knees? Small wheels or large wheels? Okay, so let's take this question in a, in a few parts. Okay. So you have not cycled for a long time and you want to get a bike. Is a mountain bike or a road bike better? Um, I think both bikes will be fine. Um, a mountain bike is easier to handle, I think, when you first begin. Um, it has wider wheels. I think it's a slightly more upright position. Um, the handlebars are wider. So in terms of safety, well, in terms of stability, it's more stable. Um, a road bike, it's a, usually slightly more aggressive in the position. This is a road bike over here. Um, you tend to be, the seat tends to be higher than the handlebar, so you are kind of um, thrown over. So the handling is quite different. Um, you can also try that, but I think if you have not cycled for a long time and you want to start slowly, um, a mountain bike or a hybrid bike may be a good choice. Okay, small wheels and large wheels. So the difference is in the feel of the bike. Um, so small wheels, an example would be the Brompton. Um, big wheels would be a normal road bike. So I've ridden a, a, a foldable bike with small wheels before. Um, it's, the feel is very different. It's a bit more twitchy. You can do a turn more easily as compared to um, a bike with bigger wheels. I think it's more stable. Um, I, I was saying just now, maybe the difference is like wearing... Um, normal shoes and some wearing high heels. Um, it takes a bit of getting used to, but I think if a um, uh, bike with larger wheels would be more stable. Okay, how do you select a bike carrier for your car? Um, okay, if you, the best thing you can do is put your bicycle in the car. So find a car that's big enough to put a bicycle in. So it won't get stolen, number one. Uh, number two, if it rains, you don't have to worry about it. But if your car can't fit a bicycle inside, um, there, are two, there are different bike holders. There are the typical bike holders where you put at the back of the bicycle, of the car, um, and there's the bike holders that you put on top of the car and you actually mount the bicycle on top. The, the ones that mount at the back tend to be easier. Um, you don't have to actually carry such... Over, you don't have to carry it over your head so it's not so heavy. Um, also, don't forget, if you put bicycles on top of the car, um, when you're going into a car park, remember your bicycle is up there because if you go into a car park, you're going to lose, you, you're going to destroy your bicycles. So I think there, there are, so it depends on you. Uh, some people prefer on top, some people prefer behind. Is there a need to use different bikes for different terrains? Um, yes, I think that but that's a good question. Um, I think there is a need. The, the right bicycle for the right terrain makes cycling very enjoyable. I've taken my road bike um, on, on a friend's challenge to go through a mountain bike trail before. It was not very pleasant <laughs> because the wheels are the main thing. If your wheels are very small, um, you may not get traction on the road on the, on the um, trail, and if it's wet, you, you may slip and fall and injure yourself. So a good bicycle, with, uh, different bicycles are useful for different terrains. Even in the um, mountain bike trails, there's a difference between a, a, a hardtail a mountain bike 
a um, full suspension mountain bike and even a downhill mountain bike. Uh, not an expert, but for example, in um, Cambridge Park, which is where we hold our downhill mountain bike races, then a downhill mountain bike would be the most efficient. Um, nowadays, um, there's also a group of bicycles coming in called um, urban, uh, cyclocross bicycles. So they tend to be a, a, a road bike that is between a mountain bike and a, um, a road bike. So they, are, they have the same geometry and frame as a road bike, but they have thicker wheels. Um, that seems to be quite fun and quite popular. Okay, so for park connectors, what kind of bikes are recommended? Um, I think for park connectors, you can ride any of the bikes that I've told you already. Um, it's down to the budget. A hybrid bike would be very useful. Um, and a mountain bike would be very comfortable. Uh, so I think there's no right or wrong answers. I, I usually ride my road bike on um, park connectors sometimes. Uh, sometimes I ride my... Uh, cyclocross bike. If you went to um, East Coast Park um, and you rented a bike, um, they tend to be mostly hybrid bikes and mountain bikes. In a car park, should one cycle in the opposite direction of the oncoming car for better sighting of the car or should the cyclist cycle in the same direction as the car? Okay. So, we are coming down to um, a question that I always see a lot of um, older right, cyclists always cycling against the traffic because what they usually tell me is that they can see the car coming and if they look, it looks dangerous, they'll jump off the bike into the bushes. I, I think that's the, what the older generation people usually do. Um, tends to be very old, old cyclists. Um, but now we know that we have to actually follow road traffic rules. So whether it's in the car park or as long as it's a road, you have to cycle in the correct direction, in the same direction as the flow of traffic. And if it's a one-way street, you're not supposed to cycle, you're not supposed to cycle against that flow of traffic. But being a cyclist, uh, being a bicycle, you can actually cycle on the footpath. And that is both directions. Is license required for cycling on cycling paths? Um, no. At this point in time, uh, no license is required for cycling on the cycling path. Okay, we got time for one last question. What would be a good versatile bike to buy for overseas trips? Oh, I like this question. <laughs> um, I'll say that if you're going to cycle overseas, um, it depends on where you're going uh, and what kind of trip you're planning to ride. If your trip is going to be uh, over a few days and it's going to cover long distances with quite a few climbs, I think you would like to buy a road bike. Um, a road bike is more efficient and it can, and it can cover greater distances. Um, you can also buy a hybrid bike. Um, a hybrid bike is um, basically like a bicycle that's between a road bike and a mountain bike, but it has slick tires like this one. Uh, there are no knobs on it, so it's very efficient. You can still ride quite efficiently. I, I think that would be a good uh, bicycle to, to buy if you're going overseas. Yep. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, what would be a good bicycle to buy for a first-time bicycle owner? Okay. Um, a friend of mine just texted me a few days ago and asked the same question. Um, so he's not very sure yet because so I lent him a road bike. Um, so he's still cycling it and he says, not too bad. It's quite good. Uh, but he found that the position was very aggressive. It was a bit heavy. He wasn't used to it. Um, he's also tried in his past it's, um, cycling on a mountain bike and he says the handling is um, easier, it's more, com more comfortable for him and uh, more, it doesn't feel so dangerous. Um, I would say that if you are buying a bicycle for the first time, it's going to be very different. For, it depends on your ability, um, how well you can cycle and your fitness as well. It may be good if you could borrow a bicycle from somebody 
Or the other thing you could do is actually you can go to some of these bike shops. I think there are many bike shops that have demo bikes. So in that span of a few hours that you go there, you could try a road bike, a mountain bike, or something called a hybrid bike, which I was talking about in between. And you could try the three of them and see what fits you. So I think there's no one bike that fits the owner. Uh, it depends on who the owner is and what your preference is. Yep. So uh, the best thing to do is really to try the different bikes before you buy one. Yeah, and there are many bike shops which, uh, who, that will allow you to try that. Okay, thank you. I think that was the last question. So thanks for spending your time uh, with us this afternoon.